Hvala svima koji verno prate naše emisije i žele da pomognu u radu naše produkcije. Možete nas podržati simboličnom donacijom ili kupovinom naših proizvoda na sajtu balkaninfo.rs Poštovani gledalci, vi gledate intervju produkcije Balkan Info. Ja sam Aleksandar Pavković, a naš današnji gost je gospodin Giovanni Di Stefano. Velika nam je čast da razgovaramo s njim. U pitanju je čovek koji je advokat, biznismen i neko ko je ovde za našu zemlju jedan od najpozvanijih da kaže šta se to dešavalo, obzirom da ga možemo nazvati svedokom 90-ih u Srbiji, iako nije očigledno čovek odavde, ali ovo je jedna ekskluzivna prilika da čujemo možda po prvi put neke detalje o onome što se dešavalo pre svega u našoj zemlji i razgovor ćemo voditi na engleskom jeziku, tako da vas molimo za pažnju i možete uključiti titlove kako biste ovo možda bolje razumeli ako već govorite engleski jezik. Tako da sada počinjemo emisiju s našim uvaženim gostom. Mr. Di Stefano, it's pleasure to have you here with Balkan Info and I would like to thank you in advance for this interview because it's a special occasion for us to have such such opportunity to host someone like you. Thank you very much and it's my great pleasure and I'm truly obliged and I hope that we can clarify certain myths, legends, and we can distinguish the legends and myths from the truth. Yeah, uh, I agree with you, and uh, I'm sure you are able to do it. So, uh, let's start. Uh, uh, first, uh, I would like to ask you this. Uh, why did you decide to uh, come to Serbia? Actually, it was Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. It was... Uh, uh, I think uh, something like uh, August, September uh, 1992, if I, if I'm right. Uh, why did you come here? Well, after the MGM debacle, when we lost MGM and we owed Credit Lyonnais Bank Netherlands 1.23 billion dollars, which you could have bought probably half of Yugoslavia at the time there, not now. Now you'd be lucky to find a square meter for that for that price <laughs> uh, there, which is how things have improved. Um, I went to Geneva and I went to see my friend Bernie Kornfeld. Bernie Kornfeld was at one time the richest man in the world. He had a castle uh, on the border between Switzerland and France, and he was a good friend of mine for a long time. I went to Geneva first at the Diplomat Hotel to see my friend uh, uh, Freddie uh, there. And he told me that the week before he had hosted a party of Credit Lyonnais people uh, at the hotel in Geneva. And he said to me, Giovanni, you're in a very dangerous position. It's not about the money. It's about the scandal that you can cause because you are the link to the scandal. So I, he said, and these people are quite capable of killing you. So I thought to myself, hmm. I spoke to uh, 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 to Bernie Kornfeld. I met Misha Trulovic and Radoit Sinicevic, who I still don't quite understand what they were doing there, but it doesn't matter because it's none of my business. And as my clients say, the man who minds his own business is rarely killed. So I didn't ask too many questions. I had a, a friend and, and a, 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 with me called Wilkins. And I said, Jeffrey, what shall we do? He said, well, we, we better get out and go and hide somewhere for a while. And I thought to myself, where's the best place to hide where people uh, can't come? A war zone. I didn't even know there was a war in 1992. I mean, from the United States of America, other than uh, uh, I, I think you had the, one of your uh, politicians was the owner of ICN Galanica. I mean, Panich, wasn't it? There, I'd met with him in America, met with him. in. So I thought, well, it's a war zone. Anyone comes there, we can find them. 
And that's how I came to Serbia. I was invited by the Serbian government, or it was then the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Uh, 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 there, I came there. I stayed at the Majestic Hotel, which was then run by Gospodin Gavron, uh, um, who, um, that's his nickname there. He was the manager there. Unfortunately, he committed suicide a few years later uh, for, for reasons that we can go into in due course there. And I was hosted and protected because anyone coming into Serbia would be checked. So anyone wanting to try anything with me, I would have the full protection. Now, I only expected to stay like a few weeks. I stayed eight years, found a beautiful wife. We have a wonderful uh, uh, children and I am a citizen of the Republic of Serbia. Remember, Milosevic did not make me a citizen of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. He made me a citizen of Serbia. So he must have known in his own mind at the time what was going to happen in the in the future. Because had I have been made a citizen of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, I'd have nothing today. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you just came here just to, let's say, uh, run away from uh, troubles. And uh, then you met some people uh who are uh well who were very prominent here uh by business they they uh they performed here and uh they were re really let's say powerful people uh in this country uh but uh, um, d uh did you know anyone of them before uh i i don't mean uh misha chulafic and radoitsa nikšić but actually uh, there were some rumors that you met uh, Željko Rožnatović Arkan 10 years before you arrived in Yugoslavia. Is it the true? That is absolutely correct. I'm, he was working in a restaurant in London. That is it. No more, no less. You could go to a restaurant in Milan, meet somebody, and 10 years later that person becomes somebody. But at the time, you know, I didn't know. When, for example, when I met Bin Laden in 1998, he wasn't even wanted. So, you know, people say, oh, why didn't you do Who the heck, you know, it is what it is. I had met him. When I was at the uh, Majestic Hotel uh, in the restaurant uh, there with Gospodin, uh, who was the, uh, um, the uh, director of RTS Television, uh, that he was there with Rodoitzo, you know, with a number of other people there. All of a sudden, we saw a number of people, half, you know, six, seven, eight people coming by to sit at a table. Arkan was one of them. He turned around, looked at me. He came over. He said, don't we know each other? You see, what a brilliant brain that he had after 10 years, just a, a, a meeting of maybe five minutes, you know, in a restaurant, you know, many, many years back and i said well your face looks for i didn't know who the hell he was you know uh, i had no idea who he was he said yes he said we didn't we meet in london i said i think we did he said under different circumstances he said yes they were different circumstances so um that's how i met jelko forget all that crap and nonsense that's been written about bank robberies and jumping out of windows and all that and fabio whatever the hell that I am Giovanni Di Stefano. I've never been known as anything else than that. I've never done a bank robbery with Arkan yet. And I don't look as if I'm going to because the poor man is deceased. So, you know, we've never done anything like that before. And everything that we did, we did correctly and properly. Uh, okay. Uh, there are some rumors uh, which don't, uh, which are not based on some uh, bad uh bad uh, stories uh there are some nice rumors if i might say like uh, uh you are uh responsible or actually you arranged a meeting of Tsetsa and Arkan is it the truth well we went to a place where she was singing and that's as far but i mean i could be taking you to a restaurant where someone is singing and you meet someone how the hell do i know that you're going to meet, fall in love and get married. You know, it's not something that was on the agenda for Jelko. You know, he was with Natalia at the time uh, 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 there. He had his children and everything there. 
obviously, like most Balkan men, you know, th there is always indiscretions uh, there, but w it wasn't planned. There was nothing premeditated. You cannot stop the heart. You cannot st injunct the heart. I said to Jelko, do you really want to marry Tetsa? He said, I'm in love, Giovanni. What can I do? I said, well, you're married already. He said, but I'm in love. I love this woman. And I said, well, you must follow your heart. And that's what happened. And he did. And, you know, he got married. And his only worry when we went to pick her up in the Serbian tradition was to shoot the Yabuka. That was the only thing that he was. I didn't even know that, that there was. But then I remember my father-in-law, General Stanich, uh, uh, there, who also when he went to fetch his bride, my mother-in-law, he went with horses from Gucha to wherever the hell she lived in, you know, in what were then was Croatia. So that's the tradition of Serbia. You have to perform a task to see whether you can win the bride. And he did uh, shoot the Yabuka and uh, he got the bride. Yeah. Uh, yeah and uh, uh, that uh, wedding ceremony... Uh was uh, really something uh, special for uh, for the people of uh, Serbia, not only Serbia, but all the region, uh, because Tetsa was uh, popular uh, in all ex-Yugoslavian countries. Uh, did you pay for that wedding? Yes, and I'm not ashamed I've said so. And I also paid for the Halina, which I didn't even know what the hell it meant. But it was the wedding dress, which was beautiful. I mean, you need to understand that Jelko was in love and loved Teta, both. They are very rare commodities these days. You can love a person but not be in love, or you can be in love and not love someone uh, uh, there. You know, he was in love with her and loved her dearly and wanted more children and obviously... You know, we, we can go into what happened to him in 2000, which is something that it will be some something exclusive for your, you know, for your viewers there. The, the actual reality, because if you believe that Gavric acted alone with Nikolic, just have your viewers have a look at the photographs of Gavric. Nikolic and the other guy and just look at their faces and tell me if you believe that those three people are capable of murdering in cold blood premeditated Jelko Arkan Raznatovich, the head of the Subska Dobrovojka Garda. It didn't happen that way. It is not. They may have been the executors. One of them may have been. He was 23 at the time and he was off sick you know, from being in the military uh, 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 there. You know, it, this was a state-sponsored assassination. And remember, in the same way that Kennedy was killed, they used a, an idiot uh, person there to do that there. John Lennon was killed by an idiot. You know, there's also talk of that there. But Jelko was murdered because had he still lived today... He would have become president of what then was Serbia Montenegro. I would have been his foreign minister because I'm still a member of the Stranska Jedinstva, uh, you know, the Serbian Unity Party. I am still now the commandant of the Subska Dobrovoj Gada because Mr. Pelovic is dead and Zelko is deceased, both of them. That leaves me. Whether they will ever be convened again is a matter of speculation. Let me tell you this for your viewers. In the unlikely event that the borders of the Republic of Serbia is compromised, I will have no hesitation at calling the members of the Subska Dobrovojka Garda to defend the lands because I am a citizen of Serbia. I'm also an Italian citizen, I know. I was born here, but I'm very much a Serbian citizen there and I will defend those borders to the death. And I will call upon the Subska Dobrovojka Garda. And there are many, 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 you, a lot more than what you think that would be ready. But only, only, only in the event that the borders 
of the Republic of Serbia are compromised. The Serbian Guard of Volunteers does not go outside the borders of Serbia and is only convened when there is problems with the border. And that's what the guiding policy Traditionally, it was always run by foreigners anyway, because the Serbs couldn't trust themselves. It was always, you know, the Serbian kind of volunteers after the First World War was run by Italians, French and Germans. Um, the, the, so that's where we are at as far as that is concerned. Uh, thank you for this, uh, uh, let's say, offer to our country. And, uh, well, if we if we need you, we will let you know, of course, because... Uh, I'm sure you have uh, a lot of influence, uh, well, let's say, among those people who are still still uh, ready to defend this country. And uh, I would like to ask you this, uh, because you said about Arkans' uh, death, it was, uh, let's say, uh, assisted by the state or staged or uh, it was done by... Uh, federal uh, agency of security who did it uh, was it uh, done by uh, let's say someone uh, someone said uh, that milosevic thought arkan would be let's say uh, more than a bad witness for him in uh, hag process so he decided to take him out what do you think I said a state-sponsored assassination. I didn't say which state. And it certainly was not the Republic of Serbia, I can tell you, Montenegro, as it then was at the time. They had nothing. They were caught off guard as well as anything else. I have been on record in the past at putting the blame clearly on the United Kingdom, the SBS. The SBS were in Montenegro. They were there. I know the CIA were there quite a bit there because, you know, we knew all about, you know, their activities during the, you know, the time of the NATO bombing there. One of the reasons that Milosevic sent me to Brussels was specifically because I had good friendship there in Brussels. And uh, we were well aware, you know, extremely well aware of what the targets would be. And there was an incident where the RTS building uh, was bombed and 17 people lost their lives. A few people lost their lives there. I was aware of that bombing before, but would you believe that at the time I couldn't communicate it to Belgrade because the phone lines went down from the Hilton Hotel in Brussels to Belgrade. They cut the lines for a short while. And so I only managed to forewarn, you know, the, you know, the government and the Ministry of Defence that the RTS building was about to be, you know, blown, you know, bombed. Uh, but we didn't quite manage to evacuate all the people at the time there. And when that incident occurred, um, I then decided that I would come back into Belgrade and stand my ground in Belgrade. And I lived in Jenik's apartment, a glass building. Everybody had vacated. I was the only person there. And that stopped NATO from bombing Jenik's and the Intercontinental Hotel. Uh, uh, there because they would have had to kill a European Union citizen and not that they give a flying Ferrari about that but it would have been harder for them you know to uh, you know to deal with that there let me tell you something else also that is quite amusing to show you how stupid and how negligent NATO were do you know why the building of the Chinese embassy was bombed by mistake, they said. Do you know why? Well, let me tell you. When I was in Brussels, I saw the maps of Belgrade, which NATO had for bombing. They were the old ones. They didn't include because at that time it wasn't included in there. They were the old maps. And I thought, Jesus Christ, we're in the hands of mad people here. They're bombing people with that. The Chinese, but for... A, a whisker did not retaliate, but for a whisker did not retaliate with a nuclear attack, you know, on NATO uh, uh, that. Now, I can tell you that I dealt with the Chinese on that uh, there. What we then did was the Chinese ambassador who was in Belgrade, I had him come to Genix with me for a while. And do you know where I moved him afterwards? 
to number three, Lutitsa Bogdana, because they were going to bomb Arkan's house. And I put a stop to that. I said, Jelka, let's move the ambassador to your house there for a while. I notified NATO that the ambassador, and he notified, and that's what kept Lutitsa Bogdana. And they were going to bomb Red Star uh, uh, ground as well. They had intentions to bomb that. And I remember talking to Alistair Campbell. I remember talking to a number of people. Uh, um, Berlusconi, you see, was my very, very good friend. We fell out. We had a massive argument over the use of Aviano and the Italian air bases. And he said to me, but we have no choice. We have no choice. We have to give the base. I said, fuck you. We don't have to give the bases there. You do not have to. Austria didn't. So why on earth should Italy? But he said, no, I'm under pressure. I'm under pressure from the Americans to use the bases um, uh, uh, there. What then happened was that I put him under so much pressure that Aviano Air Force bases were only used for refueling purposes. The aircraft that took off from Aviano were not allowed to carry bombs. And that's the best that I could do um, uh, uh, there. I also protected the American embassy, the British embassy, the Italians, of course, had a free hand because I issued them with a visa, Ennio Remondina from Rai Television. I issued them with a visa. And Christian Amanpour, she also was allowed to come in, my good friend there. Now, there was talk of someone wanting to kidnap her and take her hostage. I put a stop to that straight away. Remember, I am a General Pravilini in Subscot Obrovojka Garda. And, you know, effectively, I said to Jelka, this woman is under our protection. If anything happens to her, you and I are going to pay the consequences in due course, leaving aside that she's a wonderful person and very, very impartial, unlike Arnold van Linden of Sky, who told me I am on the side of the Croats and the Bosnians. And I said, well, then you can fuck off from Serbia. That's exactly what I told him. And I had, a, 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 you know, withdrew his his pass for you know for you know for belgrade i had that withdrawn and sent him to bloody banya or wherever the hell he went to uh you know in due course there so that's what needs to be understood why did i protect the british embassy the canadian and the american embassy i said to milosevic to slob and i said to jelkov listen all wars have an end game even the hundred years war ended in a hundred years what are we going to do after? Let's think after that. We're all going to be in peace. We're all going to be friends again, Croats, you know, which is exactly what's happened now. We're all back to semi-normal, except the situation in Kosovo, which we'll deal with in due, in due course um, uh, uh, there. And if we'd have destroyed those embassies, if we'd have attacked those there, the consequences would have been far more serious. Serbia is a small country few million people only. You know, we can't fight the whole bloody world uh, there. And that's how, by protecting those embassies and making sure, and I had men from the Subska Dobrovojka Garda, you know, uh, protect. I even had one feeding the cat at the embassy in uh, uh, in Belgrade, in the, the British embassy um, uh, there. And that's what, let me tell you also about Jelko, because you need to understand things that people don't understand about him uh, uh, there. Why he would have been president of Serbia. Milosevic and him got on very well. Who we didn't get on well was Mladic. You know, what, what Mladic was doing, I mean, in all fairness, he was a military man, but what kind of military? Where the hell did he go to school? Which military school? What Zelko said was that with Mladic, Mladic was withdrawing his forces from... Uh, Bosnia and leaving tanks and arms there intact without destroying them. You're supposed to destroy them. I mean, I'm not a military man. I didn't go to Sanders, but Jesus Christ, I know that, you know, during the wartime, all bicycles, cars have to be deactivated so that the enemy can't use it. He was doing that. He said, what kind of idiot is this man here? He said, I'm having nothing to do with Mladic. And there was a massive confrontation Karadzic was a different person. Radovan was a wonderful man there. He was caught up in something that is just simply too much for him there. He's at the end of the day, he's a psychiatrist, you know, and, and I said to him, Rado, why don't you bloody start, you know, psychiatry yourself first? Start with you before you go to others, because this is 
you know, complete bloody madness um, there. Milosevic and Afghan got on well together. There was never any issues. The only issue that arose was in 1999 when the Serbian Guard of Volunteers, Srpska Dobrovojska Garda, were on uh, Naradzinja from the Commandant to go down to Pech and to start activities there. So let me tell you what happened there, uh, there. Why we withdrew the men. I withdrew the men from, from that there. I said, Zhelkov, what you've done, you've ordered the men there in accordance with the rules of war and engagement of war, you know, and what they're going to do. But can I ask a question, please? Koito Plati, who is going to pay for these, for that there? He said, well, of course, the government. I said, have you asked? Because it's a thousand uh, German marks per week. There's 2,000 men deployed going down on the way to the Kosovo border to Pech, near where Jelko was born. I said, have you asked Slobo? Because we don't have the money to pay these. We might be able to have the money for a week. But what about afterwards? These people want bonuses and everything. He said, of course they'll pay. I said, I'm going to call him and we're going to find. So I called Milosevic. I said, look, you know, the men have gone down there. He said, no, no, no. He said, you know, that is not the instructions. I said, but the instructions from your military were to assist, you know, with protecting the borders down there. He said, well, we're not paying for them. We went to Daphina as well. And of course, she'd already stolen a whole heap of money and probably killed her husband as well. Uh, there we did. You know, uh, that she wasn't paying. So I said, Shelka, nema pare. We don't have the money for this. He said, well, Giovanni, give the order to bring the men back. And that's why they came back. And there was no massacres. No one was killed. No nothing uh, uh, there. Based upon that there, Milosevic did not want any bloodshed that was more than what was necessary in an engagement of, uh, of war. And at the end of the day, the war of NATO was an air war. We didn't have the capabilities to, you know, to beat NATO, you know, more than 20 countries there. We just simply didn't. We did the best we could. And you have seen the letter that I wrote to the European Commission on that there. And you can use that. Is it true? I don't know. Did Serbia receive that money? I don't know. If they did, where is it? <laughs> I will be asking Alex Vucic where the hell that money is. Because remember, I know him from 1993 when he was a member of the Radical Party with Sheshel and all them, that mob, that crew there. Well, this was something, uh, let's say, <laughs> this was something special you just uh, mentioned about uh, uh, NATO uh, aggression against Yugoslavia. And uh, we certainly didn't know uh, about this. Uh, details regarding uh, Arkans Tigers and uh, what was going on here in Belgrade uh, during that uh, aggression. So, uh, uh, can you tell us something more about Arkan? Uh, because you said uh, you're a general of, of uh, Serbian uh, volunteer guard, uh, Srpska Dobrovoljačka Garda. Uh, what was going on in Erdut? Well, in in Erdut was the training ground for you know you know I went there a number of times there to inspect the troops. Not that I even knew how to inspect, but I'm a general probilinia, yeah? and therefore I have to be with Jelko. Jelko does not drink; he is completely total teetotal. Even at his wedding, he only drank water and inalcoholic drinks. Uh, there, he doesn't smoke, doesn't take drugs and doesn't have tattoos and doesn't have we were inspecting the guards uh, once there and here we were uh, look you know moving from one to the other gospodin gospodin commandant gospodin gospodin giovanni gospodin general general gospodin he came across one man that had an earring in his ear he said shtaito he said oh whatever it is in sub he said boom he ripped it off in blood everywhere he said we don't have pedestrians uh, uh, here in this uh, <laughs> so uh, Another incident, we came back late at three Luditsa Bogdan and they, he had a, a dog there, a guard dog. Now, the normal policy when he would come home would be he would give a special, a special whistle to the dog to say it's the master. This time he forgot and the dog bit him really, really badly 
I was scared. I thought, jeez, his dog is going to bite me as well. But he only got Jelko. Jelko then gave the whistle and the dog, but it really right here on his, you know, there. I said, Jelko, this is crazy. You know, I had a gun with me. I said, let me shoot this dog. He said, no, 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 no. He said, I'm going to give it extra meat because it did its job. I'm the one that failed. It did its job. Jelko had two uncles. One uncle was in Moscow and one uncle was in New York. He said to me, Giovanni he said, we don't need, you know, you know, you know, the East. We need the West. I said, why is that? He said, my uncle from Moscow would always write to my father. You know, we need this. We need that. We need that. Can you send this? Can you send this? Can you send that? He said, my uncle from America would always send dollars, food, that and everything there. He said, why do we need people that need We need people that can help us. Zhelko and me were discussing going under a NATO umbrella before the NATO attack, because if Yugoslavia, the whole is under a NATO umbrella, there is no war. That war ends immediately. I came up with an idea of giving everybody 5,000 German marks in the federal, what was then, the, you know, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, every citizen to receive 5,000 German marks. And Zhelko said, why would we do that? Why would, you know, uh, uh, the way I said, well, look, Zhelko, if you have money in your pocket, do you fancy fighting? He said, well, it doesn't matter. I said, it does matter because if you've got money in your pocket and you lose, that guy's going to take your money from you. He said, you give everybody money. This war was about money, was about people. It was about nothing to do with religion. The moment that Croatia declared independence and Germany accepted and recognized that was the end. And what did the Germans do? They took all of the coastline of that, all the hotels and everything, the tourism and everything there. And to this day, you know, it, it became the Croat. And if you believe that Tujman, Ali Zigbegovic and Slobo were enemies, Think again. I've been to several meetings with all three of them during the conflict in Banja Luka, in Pale. You know, we went to all over the place there. And let me tell you, they were drinking that white, was it Slivovitz, whatever the hell it is uh, uh, there, all the time, uh, talking, jabbering as if they were all old friends and then shaking hands and going. It is a complete myth. This was generated by Germany, by the European Union, and I've written and I've told the people that. Look at my letter to Silvio Berlusconi and to Forza Italia, which I, we, we've sent you. You know, we, Italy didn't want any of this. It is the others, the United Kingdom. They want. They are always there to cause aggravation. Clinton was all for. Remember. At MGM, we had backed the Democrats with $500,000 donation. And we also gave $500,000, obviously, to the Republican Party, because you don't know who's going to win. Then you can claim some sort of friendship. And my first letter when I came to Yugoslavia was to President-elect Clinton to say, look, you know, what the hell is going on here? You know, we need help and that. But unfortunately, the media and the Germans, and, and I say so, you know, openly, because in due course, I met Klaus Kinkel, the foreign minister, on another issue to do with Pablo Escobar, you know, and, you know, he said that, you know, you know, that they had made, Cole had made a terrible, terrible mistake in uh, recognising, you know, Croatia. And that started uh, an enormous conflict that 270,000 people dead later, everybody's friends again. Everybody's friends with Germany. What did Adolf Hitler want? Adolf Hitler wanted a United States of Europe under the Bundesbank. Thank you very bloody much. He's got it. Without a shed of blood. Without one ounce of blood being shed. He's got it. He got what he wanted. They lost the war, but they won the, vi you know, the victory. <laughs> And this is what they, they, and they've got Croatia. They've now got all the hotels, most of the German investment. Belgrade is now doing, you know, fine. You know, the square meters is enormous in Belgrade. It's one of the most expensive cities to live in. Productivity, investment, buildings, prosperity. That comes after a war.
but you have to have a war first for there to be prosperity. And it was a war that was unnecessary. And I was there eight years and witnessed every single bloody day of it. And the, and and I was under NATO bombing, me under NATO bombing, and stopped them from destroying Genic's apartment and the Intercontinental and the Hyatt and three Luditsa Bognana and other buildings that I had um, uh, built. Because remember, with Shumadi, we built uh, Sremchitsa, we built Pinyes, we, you know, thanks to me, me taking over Shumadia, started a building campaign because I said to Milosevic, I said, look, we've got no bloody money. This is a cooperative. We need money. So the first money came from Mihailovic at Gusaba. They wrote me a 16-page letter as to where their apartments were. I replied to them in one sentence, can't get away to marry you today because my wife won't let me. So he didn't know what the hell that meant and he sent a messenger said can we have a meeting so and that's what brought their attention 16 page letter by the time i'd read it i would have grown a beard you know so <laughs> we started he paid us fifty thousand dinars which was then one to one thanks to avramovich uh you know the governor of the national bank of yugoslavia dragoslavia was my very 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 good friend we would a lot of the, you need to remember that a lot of the policies, the Council of Europe with Jovanovic was done by me. I'm the one that, you know, and I was following Zhelko's policy uh, uh, dictate. The policy was we want to be with the West. We don't want to be. Yes, we do want our Russian brothers and that. But we, you know, if it comes to investment and that, we prefer the West. And that was the policy under a NATO umbrella, under the Council of Europe you could go without visas to certain countries. And that's the, the application was done by me and Vlasiv Jovanovic, you know, you know, he's, he's a great, great uh, guy. Yeah, and he still, <laughs> he still uh, comes to uh, our production and we make interviews with him. He, uh, he has a special place in the uh, history uh, of uh, that era because uh, he was doing the best he could in under those conditions. Well, he had my help. I mean, just to give you an idea, uh, Avramovich didn't have the Bankers' Almanac because the sanctions bit and he couldn't get the Bankers' Almanac. So I went to London, bought the book, you know, £600, and brought it. And that's how he established his swift links. You know, it's crazy if you think about it, but that's how we did it. Remember, I could travel freely. I could travel with my Serbian passport to Iraq without visa to certain countries. Another thing what we devised with Slobov, I said to Milosevic one day, I said, look, there's a number of countries that are under sanctions. Why don't we have a consortium? of?" So I went to the Myanmar Republic to meet General Than Shuo of the Myanmar Republic, Libya. We went all the different countries, you know, and Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, and we all became part of a pact of countries under sanctions trading with each other. To me, that was a good idea. And it's now obviously being promoted by other people as well uh, there. But they were the policies. And when there were the elections in 1995, I wrote the Stranka Subsky Yedinsva's policy document, which the European Union paid us, I think, eight million German Marx as it won then to participate in the free elections, which, you know, brought to light Dodig. I mean, he was their golden boy. Dodig was the man that was going to rejuvenate everything uh, uh, there. You know, Milo was, is, is a nice guy, and I'm, but I mean, he's very controversial at the moment because now he's no longer in favour. Now he's the, you know, the per and all he wants was to have his own republic. But their matters for the people. What I remember telling Condoleezza Rice in um, uh, in Iraq was, please, Condi, she's a great musician. We played piano together uh, there. So she's a very, very good person. Said, let's learn from the mistakes of the First World War. In the First World War, the Allies just drew straight lines on countries. They didn't give a damn about anything. I said, let's not do this, you know, anymore. Let's, you know, do this with consent. If we're going to have borders, 
They don't have to be geographical borders. They have to be social borders, financial borders, economical borders, religious borders. We have to take that into account. We cannot impose our, our will. And the reason that the Middle East is in crisis now, they've inherited the problems from the First World War, from Lawrence of Arabia, you know, uh, and that's what, you know, I beg them not to do that um, uh, there. But, you know, people think that, you know, me, Arkan, Milosevic were all criminals. We certainly were not. We saved the country. We saved the Republic of Serbia. We saved Montenegro. We saved its integrity. We saved its people. We saved. And look what you have now. You have now. We have paid a terrible price for that. But I would do it all again. No regrets. None uh, at all. Yeah. Can you tell us something uh, about uh, Radojica Nikčević? Uh, you mentioned uh, in few sentences of this interview, uh, you met him uh, in uh, Switzerland. So, uh, uh, tell us something about your friendship. And uh, especially because uh, there were some documentaries uh, they they were talking about Radojica's life and uh, they mentioned you and then uh, they said something like uh, Radojica and you went to uh, Colombia to meet Pablo Escobar and to take some drugs to bring it back to uh, Yugoslavia so uh, you met Pablo uh, himself and you arranged the greatest deal uh, about drugs in world history. Well, let's put this uh, straight. Yes, I met Pablo Escobar. Rodoitza did not. I met him at the Banco de Bogota, one of the branches there. He hosted us at the Bogota Royale Hotel. We went with a private jet from the UK, from Timisoara to Cape Verde, Cape Verde to receive, receive to Bogota, and then uh, 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 back again five days later. Now, if you un just try and be logical. You need to close your eyes and be logical and not be stupid. Do you really think every plane that goes to Bogota today, private plane, even commercial plane, is tracked by the CIA? Because there is a drug situation there. So if you really think that we're all stupid, that we would go by private jet all the way to Bogota from Timisoara, knowing that, that there is Serbian people, I had my Serbian passport on board, then you are suffering from spasms of aberrations. You're completely bloody mad uh, uh, there. I had been asked to go and see Mr. Escobar there. During my time at MGM, we were planning a film on him, and that's how I got to know him in 89, 1990. When it came to 1993, when we did this trip, he, you know, he has said, Please, Giovanni, I need to come to see you. I need to ask you something uh, uh, there. He'd read that I was in there. He paid for the flight. He paid paid for everything, the hotels, all of that. Now, you would think, how is that possible? I don't know how. I don't care. He did everything uh, uh, there. So we met. What Mr. Escobar wanted of me was asylum for his wife, mother and children. He said, please find me a European Union country. He said, if you find me a country where my wife can claim asylum and live there, not me, because I'm wanted and that, but my wife, I will make sure that no drugs go into that country or its neighbours when we got. And that's that, that's all that it was half an hour meeting and, and no more than that. So Rodoisa did not meet Pablo, but I did uh, uh, there. I warned M Mr. Escobar, be careful on satellite phones because the CIA tracked everything you know uh, there i said in colombia you're semi-safe but just be very very careful he paid a terrible price for not listening to my advice six months later but i went back so i saw the italian foreign minister emilio colombo i said look emilio we have this situation italy will have no drugs providing you no 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 he said the government won't allow it i went to see douglas hurd in london you know i went Ironically, I saw him at the National Westminster Bank's tower head office. Why we met there, I still don't know. But he was a director of the NatWest Bank as well um, there. So I said, you know, Mr. Hurd, I know your wife. You know, she's a magistrate. I, I know his wife for like 20 years. That's how he saw me. I said, look, there's an offer from, you know, someone in Colombia. 
There'll be no drugs in the UK or that if you give them. No, 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 no. I went to France to see Roland Dumas, who then helped me in uh, uh, that, who was the um, foreign minister at the time. I said, you know, Roland, look, we have a situation uh, uh, here. I said, we need asylum for four people, you know, two children and two adults. You know, who are they? I said, it's Escobar. No, no, no. He said, we, you know, there's no way that that's going to happen. I went to see Alan Juppé later as well when, when he, they changed that. I went to Germany to see Klaus Kinkel. He said, no, 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 absolutely. We can't harbour you. Know, it's too dangerous. I said, but you're not going to, he's going to guarantee you no drugs. I couldn't find a single country that would allow that uh, 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 there. Had those stupid people, it was no good asking Serbia because there's no drugs in Serbia at the time. And you know why? Because no one had any bloody money to pay for them. It was hard enough to buy cigarettes and petrol and everything. Imagine if you're going to buy drugs. We'd, you only have a drug problem where there's money. No money, no drugs. So Serbia didn't have that. There's no good asking, you know, Milosevic, can we host them here? We had enough bloody aggravation already as it was without adding to um, it there. And that is the reason. And I had to report back to Mr. Escobar through his lawyer to say, look, I couldn't find, even I, the devil's advocate myself, could not find a country that would, uh, uh, that on that basis. And how stupid and how short-sighted, had they have accepted, these were innocent people, the wife, the children, the mother, had nothing to do with what, you know, were there. Had they have hosted and given them asylum, imagine today, they just get on a boat and go to Lampadusa or go to... <laughs> Cross the channel, it would be easy to. We did, wouldn't even need me to do that. But then, that there would have been no drugs whatsoever at all, and perhaps he wouldn't have. He would have been ha the the reason they tracked him was his phone call to his family. If his family had been safe abroad, he wouldn't have had to call them because he knew they were safe, and he would still be alive, and there'd be no drugs until obviously the day that he died of natural causes or someone killed him. Uh, uh, there. And that is the reason that we went to uh, Colombia. That Rodoitza came along with me simply because he wanted to see the city. And we took two members of the Zemun clan as well for protection. Because when you go to meet people like Mr. Escobar, you know, it's better to be careful, it's better to be caught than to be sorry. So we had our own protection. But he was a fantastic host. He put five people on our aircraft at night because they steal aircraft there, the drug people. They steal your aircraft. That We were not touched at that. And I have to say, I'm eternally grateful to him for everything. And I'm sorry that I wasn't able to complete what he wanted me to do because it would have been a lot easier for Europe. They would have had a drug-free probably 20 years, and he would have kept his word. That's why we went to Colombia but nothing to do with taking drugs. Absolutely zilch. Never discussed, never, was solely for that reason. And, you know, Rodoitza said to me, why are they, you know, when we came back to Belgrade and I'd seen Kinkel, I'd seen bloody Yupe, I'd seen Dumas, I saw all these people. They said, why aren't they accepting the offer? I said, I don't know. Even Emilio Colombo. I, I even saw Benjamin Andreotta later, just in case that one of them was, came. no way. They weren't having it, and that's the mistake Europe made. Yeah, are, can you name us uh, those two Zemun clan members? Oh, I can't remember now uh, their names, but they were very, very good people uh, uh, there. They did their job, you know, they protected. There was nothing at all. We simply took, I had protection in Belgrade from the Serbian Guard of Volunteers, Subsidia Dobrovojka Garda. But I mean, other than you know, one person who was in Rome with me, Sasha, I mean, I, I can't, you know, I really can't remember many. We're talking about now, I mean, my youngest son is 20, 27. So we're talking about an awful long time ago. And, you know, it's not names, but they were in concert. They had nothing to do with criminality at all. Nothing came on our plane. When you're flying from Bogota, you go to Recife, Recife. You then fly to the Canary Islands because, you know, the plane, you, we can do 
know, six, six, seven hours, but you can't do it. What wasn't a, it wasn't a G4 plane. Our aircraft in MGM, the G4, we could do Los Angeles, Rome or Los Angeles, Copenhagen nonstop. Sometimes I would stop at Goose Bay because I was nervous about the fuel, but that's just me being stupid uh, uh, there. And that that's how it came. Let me tell you about Slobo as well, about Milosevic. A very good man, an honest man, a very, very, very honest man. He died with, I think, $11,000 in it. He never stole any money. He was criticized by his own people because he was madly in love with his wife, Miriana. What the hell is wrong with that? I used to tell Gospodin Gavin, I told Zelka, I told Radoitz, I told a number of people uh, there. In 1993, we went to Monaco to meet Bernie Eccleston and Slavica, his wife, to bring Formula One to Belgrade, which is still very much a possibility, let me tell you. Now, Bernie has got a trial, a fraud trial coming up next month. So depending on that, that would be my gift to the people of Belgrade there, you know, because at the end of the day, we still have influence on Formula One, even though he's sold out uh, uh, there. That's what they were planning. They were not planning stealing money. They were planning on building something, of having something substantial in Serbia for Serbia to be proud of. That's what we were doing. We didn't go there to go to the casino. We went to meet um, Eccleston and Slavic. Slavica was, of course, you know, you know, Serbian as well. So it helped that his wife, they could speak the language. And what a polite lady Slavica always was to me. She's always been very good um, to me. She would always apologize when she spoke in Serbian, you know, to my colleagues there, because my Serbian is limited, very, very limited. But one thing I do know, I learned the first thing in Yugoslavia, how to count so I wouldn't get screwed over with money. <laughs> Jedem, dva, tri, čet, pet, set, zen, osem, devet, deset. Dva, deset, hiljada funti. That was the trip uh, there. Milosevic, when we were under NATO bombing, he moved for a while to the, is it the White House, the Plava, Plava, the, 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 which was Tito's house, just for a short while, because I believed that they would not, because they wanted to assassinate him, I knew that, there, but they didn't want to, they, they couldn't bring people on board because I would have known about it. Uh, there, I had very, very, very good information from Brussels. I went to school with one of Tony Blair's uh, chief advisors. So I had some very, very good connections uh, uh, there. And they would obviously were going to bomb, but they wouldn't bomb Tito's house because it's historic. So I, I banked on the. But let me tell you, he's the president you know, of Serbia and Montenegro. There was a problem with the toilet. It didn't flush. He never even had the power to call a plumber. You'd have to go through a number of channels, even during bloody wartime, because the communist regime is still the mentality in Serbia <laughs> that everything done in Triplica, Reshenia, you know, Spisak and all that nonsense and Ugovor and all of those things there, everything had to be done by the book. And remember, the president of Serbia is today Alex Vucic. He's the, he can authorize war, but he cannot order it. He can authorize the use of force, but it is for the military to decide when that is to be used. And not many people understood that. That people put the blame on Milosevic that he ordered. No, he did not. He did not have the presidential powers. And the same, let me tell you, is in America. Trump and Biden can authorize a strike anywhere, but they cannot order it. There are distinguishing factors. And they copied that from the Yugoslav presidency's powers. And that's something that you need to understand. He died in prison, in my view, unlawfully. He died an innocent man. If we live in a democratic society, he was not convicted. I predicted that he and Saddam would die in prison, you know, because that was the will. Now, was he killed? Was he murdered? At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because we cannot hold America and the UK to account. 
The UK, we might be able to. I prosecuted Tony Blair for what he did in Iraq. Uh, I, I wanted to prosecute also for you know what happened in Serbia. You saw my letter to the European Commission there. You saw what bombs that were being used that were completely unlawful. No one gives a damn. You cannot police America. You cannot police Russia. You cannot police China. You cannot police India. There are certain countries that unfortunately are above the law because they will not be told what to do. America is not even part of the International Criminal Tribunal. They refuse to, you know, we have to you know, submit to it, but they don't. You know, and this is where you have the hypocritical situation. And that's why I will always back Serbia and I will do everything that I possibly can to make sure that justice is attained. How many people in Serbia, my friend, are dying of cancer? That's more than a coincidence. That's because of the bombs that were used, the, you know, uh, unlawfully against the Serbian people there. And I am not scared of anything. I will say it and I will say and I don't care what it costs me. The truth is the truth. Honour is honour and dignity is dignity. A man that has none of those three is nishta is not even a chovak. I don't want to mention the word what he is, but it begins with a K and ends with a C in Serbian. Uh, everybody understood. There are many people uh, who are not with us today. Uh, one of them was mentioned a couple of times in this uh, video. Uh, we're talking about Radojca Nikčević. I'm sure you asked yourself, uh, what happened so he lost his life? Well, in October 1993, the day before he was killed, uh, my now wife, uh, we, weren't, we weren't married then, we were invited to dinner uh, at Radojca's house with his wife, Senja, you know, who incidentally worked for the Ministry of Interior and he was an excellent translator and superb. He'd done a lot of translation work there. So we, we and, and Rodoita spoke a number of languages and so did Jelko uh, there. So we went to dinner there and we got back to Jenik's apartment very, very late in the day at something in the region of about midnight. Now, Rodoita said to me, Giovanni, be ready. 8.30 to 9 o'clock, we need to go to the office to deal with some stuff with Shumadi there, because I was giving a hand and helping, and Radio Penguin, which we'll deal with, um, and Cafe Penguin as well, which we'll deal with, um, you, know, in, you know, in due course uh, there. I said, OK, however, when you have a very, very beautiful woman with you, timings are not always to be respected. And so I got a phone call from downstairs, you know, from Rodoitza, he was there and Jenik says, come on, Giovanni. I said, no, 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 you go and I'll come later on. He said, you know, I'm, I'm tired. You know, we had a late night and that. He said, okay, but don't be late. Had I have gone with him, inevitably, I'd have had to be killed as well. Maybe uh, uh, that, but the chances are pretty good. You know, you hit one, you hit both. For what reason? is still not crystal clear because he had nothing to do with drugs and he certainly was not involved in any kind of criminal activity. Yes, he knew many criminals, but so do I. I represent a number of terrorist organisations. It doesn't make me one, though. It just means that a representation of that uh, uh, there. So he was murdered. I got a phone call uh, uh, later on, you know, from, you know, from Lydia, his secretary, all inside. I had to pass it over, you know, you know, you know, you know, to my wife. I said, oh, what the hell is, is this woman saying? She's crazy. And she said, Rodoitz has been killed. So I quickly got up, went there. What shocked me was that within half an hour, the crime scene had been cleared. There was still blood on the ground and brains on the ground where the, someone had shot him in the back of the head as he was walking. That alerted me. Uh, obviously, you know, I've done a number of murder cases there. And one of the things that's seen of the crime is the most protected place, especially the first 28 hours. 
Dubinko, who was the driver, was already sweeping up and washing up on the orders of the police. So I was somewhat concerned. You know, I went to the to the police there, to the, I forget his name now, the Minister of Interior, uh, who gave me the citizenship. And I said, look, what the hell? He said, let's just close this. You know, we just keep this closed and we'll investigate and find out, you know, why and wherefore. So I had to accept that. Um, that I went with my lawyer as well, Dubrovka, you know, who I gave my witness statement, said, you know, what had happened and everything uh, uh, there. And I still to the, the next day, when I went to Shumadia the next day, because I was going to be sure that for 40 days there was a cup of coffee on his desk and his cigarette uh, there, which is the, re the tradition of Serbia, you know, you know, for one that's killed. When I was walking through uh, Vase Pelegica 54 there, where you get to Shumadia, uh, there were two men that looked like gypsies that were there on the grass there. I had two guns, Dve Utoka, in my back pocket. And I'm telling you now, I swear to God on my father's tomb, had those two men moved one inch or put their hand anywhere near anywhere, I would have shot them dead and accepted the consequences in due course. As it happens, they looked at me, I looked at them, and they just turned around and disappeared from everywhere. But I swear to you, had they have made one, all they had to make is one move, and I had, they would have been blown to pieces. Believe you me, uh, there. Now I am not a violent man. I repudiate war. Our Italian constitution repudiates war and violence. But on that occasion, I would have made an exception to the rule there. You know, because no way am I going to be. But they were just there, seeing whether they should or could. Something obviously must have told them this guy, you know, is not to be uh, uh, that. Remember, I was friends also with Adkan. Ad you know, a couple of small time criminals wanted apartments from Shumadia and tried to muscle in on me. A big, 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 veliki greshka, big mistake, as they found out to their cost in due course. You know, Jelko you need to understand, was a fair man. If you owed him money on a Friday and you went to him on a Friday and said, I can't pay, can I wait till Monday? There would be a problem. But if you went to him on the Monday and said, Jelko, never pare this, that, you know, all the, all that, no problem. Because you mustn't presume that someone is going to do something in your favour. You have to be respectful and use manners and good education uh, there. And anyone trying to muscle in on me or trying to get apartments for nothing, he wasn't having any of that, and nor was I. And I had plenty of him. I had state influence. I had Jelko. We had a number of people that would back me. But, you know, you always get chances in life. And um, they found out, you know, they learned a lesson, shall we say. We had uh, a lot of interviews uh, with uh, Jarko Popovic. I don't know if you heard of him. He was... Uh, okay, so you know uh, who, who I'm talking about. So, uh, uh, he told uh, us that uh, uh, he went to the scene as soon as he, as he could, uh, when Radojca was murdered, and uh, he saw you and Jovica Stanisic uh, standing there. Correct. That is absolutely stunning. Yeah, he's a good friend. He is a good, you know, uh, that he, he did. Well, obviously, he's Minister of Interior. From Dub, you know, Dub, I mean, obviously, you know, he's head of uh, that. So I wanted to know why the scene of the crime was being washed. And because he explained to me at the end of the day, Giovanni, this is not a cold case murder. This is not a murder that we need to investigate with DNA on that. They already knew, basically, more or less what had happened uh, there. It certainly didn't come from the state. That was not a state. That was not. That was, I don't know, but, you know, certainly it was not a state-sponsored assassination. And I'm talking about the Serbian and Montenegrin state. That was definitely nothing to do, and nothing to do with criminality or that, because Radojca, I was with him day in, day out, also with Jelko. 
There was no criminality uh, involved. Yes, there was some petrol being brought in. Look, I have a humanitarian fond de Stefano. I gave away a million German marks in, you know, to hundreds and hundreds of even school books, uniforms. We paid for a couple of people to be in London at drama school. You know, we spent a, a million German marks on that there. I brought in 150 films from Switzerland, from, you know, MGM for RTS to see when there was a glut of that. I brought in television cameras, the big old ones, not the new ones now, but the very cute well, ones that they're from Budapest. We brought them in. I did not break the sanctions because I'm a Serbian citizen. It's my duty to help my country. Had I have been an Italian citizen, I would have been prosecuted in the UK and in Italy for breaking the sanctions. But I can't be prosecuted because I'm a Serbian citizen. I'm helping my own country. And that's why they gave me the citizenship almost straight away. The moment I brought in the movies and showed them and we brought in, you don't know how much medication that I brought into ICN Galenica with my plane from, from Switzerland to Timisoara. You have no idea how most of the medication that came in was, you know, from me. Now, people say I'm a criminal, I'm this, I'm that. You know, they don't know the facts. They don't know what we did at the time for everybody. And I didn't profit because at the end of the day, how many of um, we had thousands of apartments, which I governed in, in Belgrade. How many apartments do I have in Belgrade? None. Nishta. Nada. Nothing. We didn't take. We could have had uh, Nesna Yunak. I could have had Durmatoska. I could have had all the prime sites in that, but it's not correct. And I refuse to take anything that was not correct. We gave contracts out, not on the basis of the plavel envelope on a Saturday, but on the basis of people who could supply the appropriate things. And, you know, at first people would come to my office on a Saturday and I'd drink the coffee with me and then leave envelopes. And I and I remember saying to even my secretary, what the hell are the envelopes? She said, oh, that's the money that normally you, you know, I said, no, no, no. I said, you give that back. You know, we don't want anything to do with uh, that there. These people get contracts based on the basis that they merit the work. And let me tell you, the work that we did in Shremtica, the concreting, everything was to a perfect standard. I would not accept in one instance, there was one Ulitsa there in Sremchitsa, which I tested the concrete and found that there was too much water there. I made them redo the whole bloody thing, you know, were, uh, there to put it correctly. And there was trouble with the contractors. And I made it crystal clear that if it happened again, there would be, shall we say, serious consequences. Because at the end of the day, anything goes wrong with those buildings, I am to blame. In Serbia, the director takes the blame if a building collapses or anything like that. And every single building that I built had a, a nuclear shelter. Now, that wasn't mandatory, but I said, let's just do it, because if it was good enough for Marshal Tito, it's good enough for me. Uh, you succeeded uh, Radojica Niktovic as the head of uh, Shumadia Cooperative. Uh, can we say it was his will uh uh that you will be you would be the best person for that well no because he wasn't planning on dying he hadn't thought about who the hell would succeed him uh, uh he, 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 you know he wasn't planning on dying but what they wanted to make ra uh, a guy called Radi, a youngster of 27 years of age head of shumadia head of penguin i said no 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 he doesn't have the experience i said i will do those i spoke to milosevic spoke to Jelko. He said, no, no, of course, Giovanni said, you know, you do this temporarily and get things done, you know, and honour Radoitz's name, which is what I did. You know, what I did, we completed Sremchitsa. All the lamels there were completed by me. I made sure Durmatoska, you know, when we evicted one man there, who was an American uh, uh, there, there. Let me tell you, that this is really a, an amusing story. For us to build Durmatoska Street, there was one flat that we had to get an old man out of, but we couldn't get him out. He didn't want any kind of money or anything. The first NATO bomb, where did it fall? In Durmatoska. <laughs> you couldn't, 
you couldn't make it up. And Jelko said to me, you have some guzitsa, Jovan. You really do. You know, you... I said, but it's not what I want. He wasn't there, of course, but, you know, he was away in America, but the apartment was. And so we were able to build the buildings that are, are there, you know, the the commercial, the locales and everything. We did everything. But that's just goes to show sometimes you need some small guzitsa to be able to uh, to have some luck in life um, uh, uh, there. And we paid the guy as well. I made sure he got more than what he wanted because it was an act of God. I mean, no one, you know, no one, you know, predicted that there, uh, that there. And I think that my time in, in Serbia, leaving aside that I found a country and found a beautiful family that I now have, um, uh, you, you, you know, that to me, has been my victory, not money, because we didn't steal any money. Not Rodoitza didn't, and nor did I. None of us have done any of that. Those people who didn't have their apartments finished was because of the war, because of the bombing, not because of anything else uh, 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 there. But now I think that technically is a good time for cooperatives to come back into Belgrade because the prices are going sky high. And it's time now for the people. And I ha do have a meeting planned with Alex Vucic, and I will be talking to him about this. I will also be talking to him about an idea that my son does not agree with, but I do. And so as I'm dad and his son, we're going to do things my way. The Plavel train, Marshal Tito's train. Milosevic showed me the train. He took me there himself to show me. Fantastic. Why can Serbia not contest? The Orient Express. The Orient Express used to do Venice to Belgrade. It was always traditionally the route. <laughs> that was the route. If we have the Plavel train where Marshal Tito had, and incidentally, Marshal Tito's funeral was the most attended by states in the world, the most people attended in the world there. That, I think, would be a wonderful example for Serbian railways to be able to promote to have the Plavel train back and to contest the Orient Express. And that's something that I'm going to be working on. We have a program, a TV program, my son and I, called In Viaggio con Papa, a trip with, you know, with my father, where we're going to do South Africa all along the West Coast by rail. He's going to be asking me questions about this, that and the other. Hope that I can answer them, singing a few songs and talking stories and telling people the history of the railways. What a wonderful thing to be able to have the Plavel train back in functioning there and back contesting the Orient Express. The Indians have one. The Pakistanis have one. The Saudis have. I mean, Jesus Christ, nearly every country has a major a type of royal plane. They're even thinking in England of the royal carriages to be able to uh, to be used for people to go on. Why can not the Plavel train? It's hosted thousands of dignitaries, thousands of dignitaries. Castro smoking a cigar with Tito, the Queen uh, there. It hosted thousands of people there. So I do believe, and that's something I'm going to be talking to him about, as well as reparations, because at the end of the day, if the United Kingdom can apologise or the slave trade in the 17th century. They need to not only apologise for what's happened in Serbia and the bombs and the unlawful bombs and the deaths that have been caused as a direct cause of that. Look how many people have died of cancer. I'll repeat it again. That's what concerned me with the European Commission. And I'm going to be taking that further because it is not time barred. You know, they need to recognise that the people who have suffered as a consequence and will continue to suffer need to have assistance and need to have proper medical attention and medical care, not necessarily in Serbia, but in other European countries who are responsible for that. And that's how things are going to be. That's what I want to bring back into Yugoslavia uh, uh, there. And that will happen. Well, uh, today we have a uh, Falcon or Soko it's a main uh, railroad in Serbia, but it's short trip. It's, uh, I don't know, half hour trip between Belgrade and Novi Sad. But uh, I would be glad 
to be honest, if we could get to Venezia uh, by a single train, because I think it's... Oh, the Flavel train is beautiful. The Orient Express, you look at the Orient Express, it always was Venice, Orient Express, down to Belgrade, and then all the way back. It would go down to Turkey as well. Uh, there, but it, you know, its main stop was Belgrade, and that, and I, and I still say that Serbian railways, because Serbia is in the Council of Europe, people don't understand what that means. The Council of Europe is a council of more than sixty countries that have a united. They are also subject to the European Court of Human Rights. That application was done by me. That application was done by me and Jovanovic, you know, Vlasi. You know, we we, we thought about that long long time ago because it was the only way that serbia was going to be integrated within the european union because people like that idiot arnold van linden and sky news which i subsequently spoke to rupert murdoch about uh, uh, then and they removed him was giving prejudiced information on the media as to how terrible things that the serbs were doing but it wasn't anything the other way around look war it's not about playing chess. It's murder. You have to kill people in a war. You don't have to talk war. You have to kill people. That's what war's about. And that's why I repudiate war. And that's why I was glad when there was a cessation of everything. But for there to be real progress, it needed the death of Ali Zigbegovic, Cole. It needed the death of Slobo. And it needed the death of Franco Tuchman, who were all friends let me emphasize that I attended a good few meetings with Franco, with Ali and with Slava. They were friends drinking that sliver bits and all that and talking, you know, and laughing and giggling and uh, that, you know. But And thanks be to God that the war ended and that there is peace now within the community. And if we go under a NATO umbrella, that will never happen again. Yes, we have a Kosovo situation. We do have that situation which needs to be resolved. That's not for me to resolve it. That's for Alexander Vucic and for, you know, Kosovo, the European Union. But my own personal view for what it's worth, why have borders? You know, there were there were parts of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia in the old days that were independent and autonomous regions within uh, uh, that. Maybe it's something that one should, cons not for me to say, because... It's not my business there. I've not been asked to, to deal with that there. But I do repudiate violence from both sides. That is something that has to stop. As Churchill used to say, we need to jaw, 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 not war, war, war. And that's what my message to Vucic and to Kosovo and to, you know, uh, Eddie Rama. I'm going to meet Eddie Rama uh, uh, also. I have uh, uh, that, you know, because the Albanians have been very, very good to me and have, you know, you can talk, uh, you know, to the, uh, and my own view is that my political party, Partito Nazionale Italiano, we do want Serbia, we want Montenegro, we want uh, Albania, we want Kosovo. If you get them into the European Union, it doesn't matter anymore. The borders don't care because it's all one. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. That's how you get rid of your borders. You join a club. Then there is no more problem. If you're under a NATO umbrella, you can't be attacked. There is no problem. There is no war. You can't fight each other. You can't fight Kosovo. You can't fight Croatia. You can't fight Bosnia. You can't because you're under a NATO umbrella. <laughs> can't do it. You have to resolve things peaceably. That's the answer. And that's what I've told you know the European commit. You know the European Commission's head. We need to bring Serbia, Albania, and Kosovo, and Montenegro into the European Union immediately, whether they're ready or not. Jesus, you could bring some of the other countries. Romania was never ready, nor was Bulgaria, but they came in. Estonia, Lithuania, as my son said, they haven't even got a team in the Champions League, but they came in. Serbia has got Red Star, Partizan. And had Oblic, not anymore, but you know, in my time, I took the club to the Champions uh, League in Germany, and I met Beckenbauer, I met Rummenigge, 
you know, we met with these people that with the utmost of respect, I dealt with the UEFA when they wanted to, to strike us because of Jelko's participation in the club, even though Teta was the president. I met Hessels Hill, Atletico de Madrid. I did all of that. Uh, they took that club there and made it into a club. And people say Jelko was threatening people. Crap. You can't threaten people. You can see if a game is fixed or not. Easy uh, uh, there. Jelko was fighting even for a corner. Never mind about, you know, uh, anything else. His ideology, when I walked into Obelic Stadium, when we didn't have the new stadium, he said, Giovanni, read that notice there. Of course, it was in Chirilitic. I ain't got a bloody clue how to read, you know, uh, Latinic. Never mind about Chirilitic. I said, what the hell does it say, Jelko? Oh, he said, yeah, you can't read that. It says, you must win. That was the order. You must win. But not with a gun to someone's head. None of that. That's nonsense. Total crap. Because I would have known about it and I would have had to be participant in it. And that never happened. It just simply did not happen. The people there were brilliant. Were there any transfers that were subject to review? Well, you can say that about Manchester City. You can say that about Man United. You can say about Luton. You can say that about Arsenal. Most of these, you can certainly say that about Juventus uh, and some of the Italian clubs uh, uh, there. So nothing new there, but it's, that's different from bribing people to win games because it's impossible and it did not happen. And I'm telling you that it did not happen. And anyone who says it did is a liar. We hosted some uh, Obilic former players uh, during uh, Arkans era and uh, they, they said the same thing, you say. He was, uh, well... Uh, it was like he was a father and they were kids and uh, uh, he was very good father, fair father, honest father. And uh, they got everything he promised to them. And uh, the pressure was like, like in, uh, let's say, in, in the area of sports, not uh, like uh, some kind of, I don't know, some kind of... Uh, uh, threats or something. Uh, most of them, they uh, they had great uh, careers worldwide, and uh, some of them even took a place in a Serbian national team. They did, and there you have it. There, imagine that I'm taking the team to Bayern Munich, and I'm going to bribe the Bayern Munich players to lose. I mean, just stupid, you know. Where we did have a problem in Atletico de Madrid is that Tetsa, wonderful woman, you know, I love her to pieces, she wanted to sit on the bench with me. Well, I mean, that had never been heard of. And she had, you know, a young baby with her. And therefore, ugh, there was a problem. I said, look, Tetsa, these people are not going to play if you sit on the bench and UEFA have ruled. So I spoke to UEFA and we had an agreement. She could sit on the bench, but she had to have her uh, shirt up to her neck there and no baby and no nothing. And that's how, again, the diplomacy of the devil's advocate had to come through there. Otherwise, there would be no game. They would have called the game up and we would have lost the game. But thinking about it now, she's the president of the club. I was president of Campo Basso. I was also a director of Dundee. I sat on the bench. I sat in the, the bench of Campo Basso many, many times. So it's a question of discrimination. Why should a woman not sit on the bench? You have female trainers now. We will live in a time, I'm telling you, but maybe not quite in my time. I'm 68 now and like time is limited. But certainly in my son's time, we will live in a time when there will be a female manager of a Premier League club who will be in that. There are male managers of female clubs. So why can't we have, you know, but of course, 1995 was a different situation <laughs> there. We were like 30 years ago. They didn't quite see Ted to the pop singer, beautiful woman, you know, uh, uh, there who was breastfeeding her, her baby sitting on the bench with a low cuts, that was not going to, um, 
you know, to happen. But she's a wonderful person. As far as I'm concerned, she's always been very kind to me, very correct to me. And it's unfortunate what has happened. Her life has to move on. I respect that. You know, Anastasia's now is a, a grown girl there and she's a singer with her mom. And you have to do the best you can. Of course, their father is always there in the background, even though he's no longer physically with us. And life has to move on. But they've never forgotten their father. She's never forgotten her husband. And she's had her own troubles. The state have caused her an enormous amount of aggravation with ridiculous allegations and house arrests and this, that and the other, which was unfortunate. And I would invite, you know, you know, any government to cease and desist on picking on widows or widowers in situation like that, because it's not appropriate to up there. Had I have been around there in Serbia, I would have obviously spoken to some people because that's unfortunate. There was she had nothing to do with bribing people. She had nothing to do with illegal transfers. Tets is a singer. She's a mother. No, she's not a football agent. She, you know, uh, she's not stupid on money, but she definitely a hundred percent never took any cash or anything underhand or anything like that. And nor did and nor did Jelka, and nor did I, and nor did Tarpe. And nor did any of uh, uh, the people uh, uh, there. We didn't do any of that at all. Rubbish. Crap. Can you tell us uh, something about the clash between Arkan and Shashel? Yes. Well, we, the, this, this all started, unfortunately, during the elections in the 90s there. I remember uh, me and Jelko going to Banja Luka. We had a female president. I can't remember her name, though. We proposed her as president. Biljana Plavšić. Plavšić, yeah. Uh, there and we got as far as the the border there and I didn't know until about half an hour later but there were guns being pulled and everything point we had an Indian standoff you know I sort of took it I was in the front seat there so I thought hmm, this is going to end badly especially for me I didn't have an I didn't I, I wasn't carrying an auto car at the time there more's the pity uh, but even if I had I You know, there's, there, there, were, there were machine pistols there. You know, you, you're just that. But things were resolved nicely. Sasha, Vuk and Jelko, it was all dealt with. And they were Sheshul's people there. Uh, uh, there. And we personally had nothing against the Radical Party uh, uh, there. I mean, Alexander Vucic was a member of the Radical Party. I met him many a times. He came to my office in Shumadia, uh, that a couple of times as well. And he is a good boy. He is a, you know, a good president. Probably should wear a tie more often when he meets people. But um, that's that's a matter of, you know, personal choice um, uh, uh, there. And there was a ideological difference between, but it did not extend to violence there. And Sheshul, fair play to him, surrendered himself at great cost. And I would not have advised that. But he did at great cost, you know, for basically for nothing. But Jelko had really no major disagreements with anyone because he, he, he told me, he said, look, fighting a war costs you money and time and stops you making money. He's absolutely right. So we try to avoid conflicts and political conflicts. But, we, you know, the ideolo ideology of Stranska, Stranka Srpska Jedinstva, of which I'm the foreign affairs spokesman, was the West. We wanted money. We wanted the West. We wanted the Russia couldn't help us at the time. Maybe they can now. I don't know. You know, we wanted to be friendly with it. Marshal Tito was friendly with everybody. The Serbian passport, the Yugoslav passport during Marshal Tito's time was the most expensive to forge. It was the most expensive to obtain unlawfully because you could go anywhere without a visa. How much nicer it is to be friendly with people instead of a war. You can catch many more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. <laughs> That's for sure. So uh, what about the rumors uh, uh, regarding uh, Mira Markovic? As uh, let's say Sheshel said... Uh, Mira Marković, uh, Slobodan Milošević's wife, 
she was uh, uh, red witch uh, uh, she dragged him to to disaster uh, she was uh, the voice of KGB whispering uh, at his uh, ears and he was uh, making mistakes because of her right Utter sranje in Serbian. That word I do know. Mira is a good woman. They were. She was in love with her husband, and he was in love with her. And the the major criticism was why President Milosevic did not have a Lubavnitsa because everybody seemed to have one uh, 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 there, and you know the wives seemed to accept it. He did not. He was in love with his wife and she with him. They had ideological differences too, let me tell you. I know. I know uh, uh, Marco. I know his son. I know Miri, you know, his you know his daughter. They were very, very kind towards me. They were very correct towards me. So was Miriana uh, uh, Milosevic as well. She was very, very correct towards me. Now, what happens between closed doors and in the bedroom? How, hell, I don't know. I wasn't there. We didn't have web cameras. Then did Slavo and his wife have differences? I know they had ideological differences because she was a staunch communist. He was a quasi-communist, uh, 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 you know. But this communism ideology will always be there in Serbia for another two or three generations. You cannot wipe it out. The Russians have tried and cannot wipe it out. And in any case, let's just have a quick look at communism. What the hell is wrong with it? During Tito's time, everybody had an apartment, everybody had a job. And if you didn't have a job or we weren't studying, you were prosecuted for vita parisetaria, for being a parasite on the state. It's not what uh, the state can do for you. It's what you can do for the state. So what is wrong with everybody having a holiday Everybody having an apartment, everybody having one car, everybody having a job. What the hell is wrong with that um, uh, uh, there? What people wanted was an induction of the West. They wanted to have more than their neighbor. But that's the ideological difference between Milosevic and his wife. She was a staunch communist and wanted everybody to be equal. Nothing wrong with that. I don't criticize that um, uh, there. I don't necessarily follow that ideology. There has to be some form of ambition because all humans have that. Milosevic was more relaxed. He had to be because he had to move with the times. You know, the Russians were also relaxing their communism. The Chinese were relaxing their communism without you even knowing about it. Look how many Chinese people you have in, in Belgrade at the moment. Silently, they move in on you without you even knowing and take over your country. Which is what's that? Look around you and see. In Way back in my time, if a black person had committed a murder and you needed an identity parade, you'd be hard pushed to find eight people black people to have an identity parade to see which one it was. Now it's different. Now there's an integration. And I love it. But I also uh, believe that with integration comes responsibility. You integrate into a society. You don't change that society. And that's where England and potentially Italy is going wrong. England has gone wrong because they've allowed an influx of immigration. But that influx of immigration has not integrated into society. They want to form their own society. Serbia's got it right. If you want to come into Serbia, Russians, Ukrainians, whoever the hell you are, whatever, we don't mind, you know, if you if you have something to add, but you have to integrate within our society. And before the Balkan War, you had a, a, a political parties from Albania, you had political parties from Croatia, you had religions, you know, everybody was quite happy. There was no issues. It was only when the Germans, as I said to you before, pushed Croatia into going independent and with the promise that they would be recognized. Because Cole told me, we promised Tujman that we will recognize you if you claim independence, which was unlawful and contrary to the European uh, uh, Union. But who could do anything about it? They were leaders of the European Union. They they were effectively 
the inheritors of Adolf Hitler's ideology to be, you know, a United States of Europe under the Bundesbank. So no one could do anything about it. And before they knew about it, you had yourself a situation. That is why I like the Balkan, I like the Serbian immigrational policy of President Vucic. He's understood. He's He has gone aside from the radical party. He's learned the lesson from there. And what he's done is that he welcomes immigration who have something to add to this country. And that's what I always wanted. That's what Stranska Subsidy was about. We welcome everybody who can add. So he's copied from us, but it doesn't matter. The only important thing is, is the citizen happy? And if the citizen is happy, there's no problem. If they're not happy, trust me, in the Balkans, you've got a massive problem, a big problem. If the citizens are not, because everybody's heavily armed. My wife was taught how to shoot at the age of eight. It was part of the curriculum in school to protect the, um, uh, you, you know, your, your your country. Dangerous. And remember, the Celtic women could fight equally to their men. The Balkans, the Belgrade was a Celtic enclave. Your women there are strong they're tough they're strong-minded they're resilient they're not scared they can stand up to you not in europe europe they're thin and that you know that, that you know uh, that but in the balkans you try and tell a woman what to do and see how far you can get physically they're the same as you and that's their balkan heritage and that is the celtic heritage because the men would go off and fight and the women had to survive and fight between themselves so physiologically, that's the situation. You have a fantastic, beautiful country that now can prosper under a government that has a proper policies, which it seems that Vucic has learned, you know, a good lesson uh, there and he's going in the right direction. Well, you mentioned uh, wives, uh, women here in Balkans. Uh, is it true that you, uh, you, your wedding actually was uh, as bright as uh, Arkan's wedding? Well, let me tell you about that. Um, we had uh, we. I was married in Belgrade for one. Milosevic gave me the authority on one condition. He said, "I give you permission. I'm going to tell my minister to give you permission to marry on the 17th of June, 1995." You know, he said, but. You have to have a translator because you've got to understand what the hell you're getting into when you're marrying a Balkan woman. I remember that conversation in Tolstoyeva. Um, uh, there he said, you have to understand what you're getting into. You're not buying into your European women. This, this is a you know, a you know, Serbian woman and you need to understand. So I agreed to that there. But the ceremony and the wedding, the, the feast that we had was in Italy. So how do I get 200 guests to Italy? I have to persuade the foreign minister uh, that he's to give me permission and a license to fly two jets, from Be which was under heavy, 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 heavy sanctions. And everybody was against it. But Giovanni Di Stefano, uh, having protect, you know, uh, protected the Italians and done everything that you know, we possibly uh, uh, could and enhanced, and having good relationships, we were hoping to have a good relationship with everybody. The minister, controversially and under some criticism from Parliament, gave licenses for Yugoslav Airlines, two jets to come into Ciampino. But those KURACs at the airport, the, the people there, what they did was that we had permission to come, but they checked every single passenger. So when we came there, they were two or three hours late. The buses were ready, but it didn't matter because we were married. We were happy. You know, you know, everything was nice. Our wedding was paid for. Some of it was paid for by Jelko. Uh, some of it was paid for by the government as well. Uh, we had a, a massive amount of Subska Dobrovojka protection. We had the special passes. You had the Italian security services that took over a whole hotel, you know, to make sure to see who the, each one was. 
and I got my way. I, you know, uh, one way or another. And that just goes to show that when you have right and justice on your side, you can overcome anything. And that's what I proved that you can do it. I got those people, the Serbians, to there, and I got them back to Serbia, and everybody was very, very, very happy. And 30 years on, you know, I'm still, as my wife says, seriously married. Well, that's, uh, let's say, that's maybe the biggest truth you revealed today <laughs> to us. So, uh, I would like to ask you uh, one thing uh, which can be considered as rumors. Uh, I, I saw a documentary movie uh, which, which uh, talks about uh, Radojica Nikčević and uh, there is some part, some 20 minutes when they mentioned you and uh they were let's say they were trying to uh to revive the time and then they uh they use actors i don't know if if you if you've seen that uh, movie uh -huh. yeah and uh, there is one scene when uh you you said i mean you uh, the actor said uh i'm gonna buy aircraft carrier so what about it? That is absolutely correct. And let me tell you this. I've posted this on Twitter and that as well. We did buy uh, HMS Vengeance, an aircraft carrier, me and Nicholas Van Hoogstraten, uh, 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 there. It was with the intentions of putting asylum seekers on board that uh, uh, ship there. And if it's good enough for sailors, it's good enough for asylum seekers and charging the government small money. They said, oh, crazy, crazy. So we sold it a two and a half million pound profit to the Chinese to be destroyed. But look what they've done now, 20 you know, years later. They've brought, you know, you know, ships to house uh, asylum seekers, which are costing hundreds of millions. And who's crazy now? Koito, Ljudi, no one's, we, we had it right in the first place. It was correct in the first place. So we did, that is absolutely, uh, 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 you know, Totally correct. HMS Vengeance, that is absolutely correct. And I was right to do so. And had they have listened to me at the time, had they have taken me up on the offer, would have cost them £80 per week. Now it's costing them £500. Madness. But that's your UK because the UK don't give a damn about its citizens. They care about their own government uh, 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 there. They could not even run a bath, let alone a country. And they are slowly bankrupting its uh, citizens. Europe is being bankrupted for taking sides over a war. It is very reminiscent to me now of the Balkan situation where people took the sides of Croatia, Bosnia, uh, uh, you know, against Serbia. And that was a massive mistake. You don't take sides when there's conflict. You let people resolve their own problems in a marriage. If me and my wife ever argue and my son takes a side, it would be absolutely disastrous. Because then he's stuck with uh, you know, the person who subsequently you might even find was wrong. But he's taken a side. So you mind your own business. And remember what I said to you from the first time. One of my clients said to me, one of the organized crime clients uh, here in Italy, a very serious family from Palermo. The man who minds his own business is rarely killed. <laughs> That's the truth. So, uh, well, for for the end of this conversation, I, I would like to ask you a simple question. Uh, uh, would you like to to uh, come to Serbia? Do you have any plans regarding uh, visiting Serbia? You you said already about this. Uh, Co cooperatives uh, like Shumadia was, but uh, do you have any concrete plans for Serbia? Well, I have um, an appointment with the president in due course there. That appointment will be scheduled commensurate to my timetable and to his timetable there. I am a Serbian citizen. It is my country. You know, they cannot, no one can take that away from me uh, there. I can come anytime I want, whenever I want and go whenever I want to. I'm free to come and go as I please there. And, you know, that is something that I will be exercising very shortly. We'll be glad to see you here. And uh, I would like uh, once again, 
in behalf of all Balkan production and uh, all uh, people, all our spectators to uh, uh, say uh, thank you, Mr. Di Stefano, for this conversation and we'll be happy to talk to you again, uh, of course, if, if you have time and uh, would, it would be great if you uh, could manage to come here to, to visit us and to be our guest. It's my country. It's my country. To your country. To your country. Thank you once again. Uh, hvala i vama, poštovani gledalci. Vi ste gledali intervju produkcije Balkan Info. Prijetno. Hvala svima koji verno prate naše emisije i žele da pomognu u radu naše produkcije. Možete nas podržati simboličnom donacijom ili kupovinom naših proizvoda na sajtu balkaninfo.rs.com